Okay, hello everyone. So we are back for another episode of Science and Technology Q&A for kids and others. And we have been having a, a bit of a discussion about sort of making science fiction real, and we can continue that today. I see we already have some questions saved up from uh, last time, and maybe they're new ones, I'm not sure where they've come from. But uh, let me start off with the first one from Einstein von Rembrandt. Considering the Star Trek Universal Translator, what size samples of an unknown language will be needed to begin to understand it? That's an interesting question. I mean, if we look at uh, kind of the history of trying to understand languages where there weren't any speakers around who knew what those languages meant, it's an interesting history. So, I mean, the first thing to understand is most of the languages that are not lost, we know what they are because there are people who speak them or speak derivatives of them. So for example, Latin, we, uh, Latin was preserved in particularly the Catholic Church and other places. Um, and although it's mutated over the course of a couple of thousand years, it hasn't mutated so much. It was also taught in schools for a long time, even in classical form. If we look at something like uh, uh, Babylonian, you know, Akkadian, something like that. It was much less clear uh, what all those uh, cuneiform marks uh, that people excavated in um, uh, from ancient Babylon meant. It wasn't clear what the hieroglyphics that were found in Egypt meant. And most of these things were decoded because there was a a, a parallel text that existed. So, in the case of hieroglyphics, there was the Rosetta Stone which is a, um, a physical stone that's in the British Museum these days um, that uh, listed on it three languages. And it listed the same proclamations written in three languages, one of which was the hieroglyphic language of, of, uh, of Egypt. Um, and so that uh, gave sort of a, a big leg up on decoding things. I think, um, I think Akkadian was decoded as a result of a, um, uh, a big inscription that existed somewhere in what's now Iran, I think, um, that I think was put on, put up by, um, I think that was the famous inscription of a King Darius that um, starts with, you know, I am Darius, King of Kings, you know, the greatest ever type thing. I think it's the thing that was, uh, of which there's a good takeoff in um, the Shelley poem called Ozymandias um, that, uh, uh, as a favorite for some of us who, who um, like constructing things in the world because it features this, um, it, it's sort of concept is as this giant statue um, that uh, uh, was erected in some, somewhere and um, uh, sort of the empire that it, that it uh, was associated with crumbled and now the statue is sitting in the desert somewhere and all there is is... Um, uh, I think it has in the poem, it's, you know, two vast and trunkless legs of stone. So it's just the legs are left. And on the, um, on the inscription at the bottom, it's, you know, I am, I think, Ozymandias, which I think is Ramesses II, uh, uh, king of kings, it says, look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. And I think the poem ends with, you know, uh, the, the, there's just sand everywhere. So in other words, it's, it's kind of a, uh, that particular one is about, um, uh, you know, you may group build this sort of great empire and statue and so on, but eventually time catches up and all that's left is a desert. Um, we, can, we can hope that our current civilization will, uh, will persist better, but um, in any case, the, um, uh, the thing that, you know, in terms of translation of languages, the, the number one, one way that one learns about how to translate something like an ancient language is through the existence of these parallel texts uh, that one happens to find. Now, in modern times, when one is dealing with machine translation systems, there's been a lot of progress made in the last um, uh, probably five years in uh, neural networks for machine translation, kind of learning from examples how to translate things. I mean, it's worth mentioning that in the history of artificial intelligence, there was a big initiative in the 1960s to try and do machine translation, to try and automatically translate from, um, uh, from one language to another. 
Um, and, and actually the initiative is sort of interesting piece of history. The, one of the primary causes of the initiative was during the Cold War, uh, the sort of standoff between the, the US and Soviet Union and Russia and so on. Um, the, uh, uh, there was sort of a, uh, at some point there was a kind of a, you know, a, a hotline installed between the presidents of those, those countries, you know, just in case somebody launched a missile, they could call the other one and, and say, well, whoops, it was a mistake or, or, or not as the case may be. But um, one of the things that uh, was a big concern was, oh, there'd be some meeting between the sort of the, the poobars, the American poobars, the Soviet poobars, and uh, there would, you know, the Americans would speak English, the, the Soviets would speak Russian, and gosh, they couldn't understand each other, and somebody would have to translate. And there was kind of a, a big concern, maybe the interpreter who was doing the translation as a human between, between these uh, groups would say the wrong thing and it would start World War III. And so people had the bright idea, gosh, let's take the human out of the loop and let's instead have a machine translate between uh, you know, English and Russian or something um, so that no mistake is made. Now it's kind of amusing looking back on it that that was kind of the concept because in fact, we know that machine translation is much more fraught with, with absurd misunderstandings than, uh, than typical human translators would be. But uh, back in the early 1960s, kind of the idea was, this is going to be one of the big use cases for artificial intelligence, is let's avoid any possibility of a misunderstanding in diplomatic translation, so to speak. Okay, so in modern times, when we see, I don't know, translation, I don't know, Google Translate or any of these other services that does automatic translation, the, uh, what is now done, and it's a fairly recent thing, is that that translation is done using neural networks. And the idea is you give it a bunch of samples of, of, uh, of translations and it will then extrapolate from those. It will then deduce from the, the examples it's seen to deal with the particular piece of text you've given it. So where do those samples come from? So those samples come from parallel texts. Uh, in the case of machine learning, instead of one Rosetta Stone or one inscription from you know, Darius the Great or whatever, uh, one's dealing with um, uh, billions of words of documents um, that exist sort of in parallel. And, and one of the big sources for European languages is the European Union, which uh, for, for, it's for better or worse, takes uh, pretty much every official document and translates it into all the languages of the European Union. Um, and so that has generated like billions of words of parallel texts um, that uh, are maybe legalistic sounding texts, but nevertheless, they are in parallel between English and French and German and Italian and so on and so on and so on. Uh, maybe they'll stop using English now, now that uh, Britain is outside of the EU. I'm not sure. I kind of doubt it. I think it's become a a pretty standard generic language for, for many folks. Um, in any case, so that's a source of parallel text. There's some other sources of parallel text in the world. Another one, there's a, there's a consortium that collects computer manuals uh, and documentation that have been uh, translated by companies that make operating systems and you know the Apples and Microsofts of this world and so on, have been translated uh, through human effort into many different languages. Um, and uh, uh, people have collected that corpus of translations, and again, that's used for machine translation. But these are very large corpuses, and that those corpuses are, are used to uh, to be able to train a neural net to say, okay, feed it in a piece of French, it will kind of try and make a parallel piece of English of its own, uh, sort of remembering, oh, I've seen a piece of sort of French that looks a bit like that and it was translated into English this way, so now I'll translate it to the, uh, that way myself. Now, the, uh, so, so that's kind of the, in a sense, the, you don't really have to have a, a, a true understanding of the meaning of the French document. You just have to know, I saw a document that looked like this before, so now I can translate it like this again. Okay, so now you ask the question, what about a sort of completely alien language? How do we know what it means? Well. It's hard to know. The, you know. the way that we might know what it means is the same way that, that, uh, that children learn language, which is they, they see a correlation between a word that's said and something that exists in the world or something that happens in the world. You know, somebody points to it and they say cat. 
and then you can sort of start to uh, to learn the um, um, uh, the, the the kind of um, the correlation between um, uh, between the word cat and the object a cat. And you know, when children learn language, they typically learn nouns first because they're sort of things you can point to. Sometimes they learn verbs that are actions that they can readily sort of identify. And then later, things like sentence structure develop, and so on. Um, it's uh, um, now you know presented with sort of an, an alien species. How would you learn its language? Well, you you need to have some uh, way of 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 having an association between the 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 word that said and the the thing that it refers to. So you need some you need something which sort of points at this or that. Um, now, people have tried to, you know, in, in science fiction movies, like Contact, like Arrival, and so on, people have tried to portray sort of the process of associating the familiar with the thing that's in sort of uh, an, an alien's language, so to speak. I mean, by the way, it's not self-evident that the language would exist in anything like the same way as we perceive language. So, for example, uh, what is language? Language is an attempt to find what one might think of as a symbolic representation of the world. That is, you know, right now I'm looking at a certain visual scene. It has a, you know, a camera lens in the middle of it. It has a bunch of other things in it. Somebody might say, well, what are you looking at? And I might say, I'm looking at a camera. Okay, but there's also a lot of other detail in the scene that I'm looking at. But the part of it that uh, I might pick out it's just that part that I can describe with the word camera. I could say, well, it's a camera which has a, a lens with a particular circumference and it has uh, you know, this wire connected to it and has this thing and that thing and the other thing. You say, well, no, I just want to sort of zoom out and I just want to say, it's a camera. And you know, I, I don't know what kind of camera it is. It's, you know, it's on some uh, stand, it's on a this, it's on a that. You know, there's a lot of detail. But what language does is it, it abstracts away from that detail and it gives a sort of symbolic representation of the thing that is important to us that we want to talk about. I mean, at some level, uh, you know, I could think of the image in my, on my, that's, you know, on my retina, going in my brain, it's an array of pixel values. It's like there's this color at this position, there's that color at that position and so on. But that's not what I will choose to describe. What I'll choose to describe is this sort of symbolic version that is abstracted from all of that. So language is all about having generic words, generic uh, symbolic things that describe large classes of actual things in the world. Like I just say, it's a camera. I don't have to say which particular serial number of camera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's just this generic, it's a camera. So that's, uh, you know, that, that's sort of the, the fundamental point of language. Now, human language has the feature that it is uh, fundamentally a one-dimensional thing. That is, we, we speak language, one word in front of, and then the next word, and then the next word, and then the next word. We could imagine that we have instead a picture language where things are laid out in two dimensions and where everything is represented by diagrams. You know, in some limited situations, we do have that. But mostly, our language is this one-dimensional stream of sounds, words, whatever. That's another thing that's sort of interesting about human language, not obviously shared by all all conceivable symbolic representations of the world. Another feature of human languages is they all have nouns and verbs and adjectives and things like that. Not obvious why that should be the case. It's not obvious whether that came because there was sort of an ancestral language. I mean, we know that we look at the tree of languages that have developed, you know, there are big chunks like Indo-European is this whole group of languages that gradually split up and turn into many of the languages we know, but, but there are other languages with different lineages. Um, and, uh, but they all have nouns and verbs and adjectives and so on. They have different exotic ways of doing, for example, word order, like English is a subject verb object word order language, where we say the cat, uh, uh, what's a good example? Um, the cat ate the fish, um, and uh, the um, uh, so that is the cat subject ate verb um, uh, the fish object. So not all languages work that way. Like Latin, for example, um, would be uh, you know the cat the fish ate. Felix Pisces. Oh gosh, what is eat in Latin? Drat. 
It's been, that's what happens after 50 years, it decays. What is eat? I must know. It must be gust, uh, gust. It must be the root that comes, um, uh, gustatory must be that, um, must be the same root. So I'm not sure. But anyway, the, the word order is subject, object, verb in Latin. And, and for example, people, oh, I don't know, when the person made up the Klingon language for Star Trek, just to be exotic, they made it an object, subject, verb language. There are actually a few object, subject, verb languages that exist uh, among the, the 5,000 or so extant languages of, of, that, that, are sp that are spoken on the earth. Um, but in any case, so there are these sort of universal features of language that we have, like the existence of, of nouns and verbs and so on, um, not clear how general that is uh, to anything one could imagine as a language. I mean, I know in the construction of computational languages that I've spent a lot of my life on, we don't quite have the direct analog of nouns, verbs, adjectives. Um, it doesn't quite work that way. It's a little bit of a different way to represent knowledge. So that's, that's sort of different. Um, but then, you know, I think I've talked before in, in these uh, uh, sessions about um, uh, the languages of animals. Um, that's a, a sort of a cautionary tale for our ability to understand other languages that we've got, you know, the cats and dogs and, and uh, other uh, critters of the earth. And we don't know, you know, if they have a, a true symbolic language, um, uh, we don't really know what it is, if they have one, if they can communicate that way, if that's the way their thought processes work. We don't really know those things. So, so the, the original question that was asked is sort of how much of an alien language would you have to have to be able to do a translation? Unfortunately, the language on its own is not enough. You need a parallel text. You need maybe the, the alien language plus the alien pointing at things, like in the Arrival movie, for example, um, or or uh, sending pictures of things like in the contact movie um, to, to be able to sort of associate um, kind of the, uh, uh, the, the, the linguistic form with the representation that's given. Um, I, I think uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting question. I, lots, um, lots more probably that could be said about um, sort of what's needed to, to understand a language from scratch. I mean, I, I would say again, in, in modern artificial intelligence and machine learning, there's sort of something a little bit like that that's happening because you present a machine learning system with lots of examples. Let's say you're trying to make a machine learning system recognize images. You show it a picture of a cat, you show it a picture of an elephant. Actually, you show, don't show it one picture of a cat, you show it 300 pictures of a cat, 500 pictures of an elephant. And from those pictures, it tries to generalize, it tries to say what are the essential features of cattiness, so to speak, or elephantness. Um, that, uh, that it can use when it's presented with a new picture to decide what, whether it's a cat or an elephant or, or whatever else it might be. Um, and in a sense, you can, if you take apart the neural network that was constructed by sort of uh, learning from those pictures, you can identify certain elements of that neural network and you could say the, the neural net has learned some concepts it's distinguishing. The first thing it does to distinguish a cat from an elephant is it figures out whether it has trunkiness or not. Well, we don't in our human language particularly have a word for, you know, the shape of the thing that makes it plausibly have a trunk as opposed to not have a trunk. Um, but it's something that the machine learning system might have recognized as the most important distinguishing thing that distinguishes, let's say, cats from elephants. Um, and it might have found the sort of good symbolic representation of that. But that's something that's happening internal to its neural net. And it's not something that we necessarily can identify. I mean, one of the great uses of language for us is, well, there, there are two very obvious great uses of language for us. The most, most obvious is communicating with other people. Um, the most obvious is being able to take those detailed thoughts that we have, turn them into some symbolic representation that is uh, that uses primitives that are sort of general enough that somebody else can understand them. I mean, when I say camera, uh, I know what that means, and you know that what that means. We have this sort of shared connection of knowing roughly what that means. Now, my version of camera might be, you know, I might think of the cameras that I saw when I was a kid, which look very different from the cameras that exist today. So there are sort of different shades of meaning, but we all have the same sort of basic understanding of 
a thing that we call a camera, and that's a word in our language that that we understand. So, you know, one use of language is this is this use of being able to communicate uh, sort of abstracted concepts to other people. Another use of language is purely for us to think internally in our own minds about things, and people. Uh, have long argued in sort of philosophy to what extent our thought processes are shaped by our language and to what extent our th thought processes shape our language. Um, I'm really very convinced that our language shapes our thought processes in many ways. We can see that most clearly with computational languages where, you know, in, in the language I've spent many years building, Wolfram language, um, the, uh, uh, it very much shapes my thought processes the way that that's been built and shapes the thought process of lots of other people. And like, for example, my big adventure recently in uh, making great progress in finding the fundamental theory of physics, um, that is really a consequence of the shaping of my thought processes through decades of working with and on Wolfram language. And without that, I really wouldn't have the, 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 uh, the sort of the conceptual wherewithal, the conceptual framework to be thinking about the kinds of things I'm thinking about in terms of fundamental physics. I mean, this has been seen before, you know, in the invention of essentially mathematical language, mathematical notation, and then mathematical ideas like calculus and so on. These provided essentially uh, sort of descriptional frameworks that made it possible to actually figure things out in that case in science. But so, so there's a sort of secondary role of language, which is this internal role of the framework with which you think about things. And, and its primary role, the framework with which you use to communicate with other people. Now, when it comes to an AI, for example, right now, the language that the AI is constructing internally, the sort of its symbolic description of the way that it understands images and so on, that is primarily for the second purpose. That's primarily for sort of it to think inside itself. It, we haven't yet figured out really how to take that intermediate layer and, and make it a um, something that can be used for communication. Now, part of the reason for that is because language, as we use it as humans, is a very social kind of thing. That is, we all have to know what the word camera means, or it's not useful to use the word camera. If only, if there were only five people in the world who knew what that word meant, then great, it would be okay for communicating within that group of five people, but it wouldn't be a general thing that we could use in our language. So anyway, it's a Interesting question. All right, lots of lots of more questions here. Um, okay, there's a there's a fun question here. I'll I'll take first here. Uh, is the best way to profit from Mars exploration the selling of intellectual property gained from research done there? Can you think of any other ways? So this is a this is an interesting challenge. The question of space exploration and uh, sort of what it's economically good for, what it's good for in, um, you know, if we look at exploration of the earth in past years, I would say that um, it was a mixture of things. I mean, part of the exploration of the earth, uh, you know, the great explorers, Columbus, Cook, you know, all these kinds of people, um, part of the, the um, exploration was just like, let's go figure out what's, what exists on the earth. But there was often a subtext of, Let's find good, good stuff that we can get from, uh, you know, some other part of the world, and um, and and bring it back to sell it. Um, and I think that that's uh, you know whether it was um, uh, bringing uh, you know gold back from the new world or whether it was uh, things like that. That that was one uh, one sort of thing. The other thing was uh, you know in, in a rather um, you know very these days, unfortunate kind of piece of history, you know, things like whaling, you know, can we go find whales to, uh, to get oil from that was sort of the before we knew about getting oil out of the ground, that was sort of the source of oil for oil lamps and things like this. Um, and uh, uh, it's a, you know, one had to go sort of all over the earth to go, go, go find that. Um, but, but so, you know, a, a common motivation for exploration of the earth was sort of finding new stuff that we could bring back or even existing stuff that we could bring back in, in larger quantities to sort of the main place where people were buying and selling things and, um, and, and, then, um, and then sell it. Um, there was also a certain, to a certain extent, there was a, a concept of let's go out 
and uh, explore the world for the sake of exploring the world. Now, the subtext to that, honestly, was the story that is often repeated in basic research, um, which is uh, if you, you know, some of that stuff was done at the time of the Spanish Empire or the British Empire, and if you are a dominant empire, then going out and finding new stuff in the world because you are the primary economic power, and if there's new stuff generated, the chances are it will fuel your economy. It makes sense as sort of a monopoly. So I mean, in, in um, you know when uh, when AT and T and Bell Labs, when that was sort of the monopoly that ran the phone system in the U.S., there was lots of kinds of research in electronics and other things, um, many other areas where the primary beneficiaries of that research would be the phone system, and so it made sense to do basic research, even though it wasn't um, uh, even though it wasn't specific to some particular product, because sort of anything that advanced that would be primarily a benefit to the sort of monopoly that was operating in that area. And so that was a, you know, when people were like, uh, in the case of the British Empire or the Spanish Empire or whatever, like, let's go out and explore the world. It was partly with a subtext of, well, you know, if something new is discovered, we'll benefit from it. Um, so, you know, I think when it comes to space exploration, th there are challenges there about, you know, what's the point, so to speak. There's a certain point of, um, uh, you know, let's go and um, uh, let's just go and explore things for the sake of science and so on. But that, uh, you know, in the end, uh, people's, uh, you know, the world's appetite for, for spending its resources on that is somewhat limited. Um, you know, I think that people have hoped that, oh, we'll be able to mine things. Like, like asteroids are pretty good for that because asteroids have been sort of, uh, have accumulated large amounts of different kinds of elements, you know, you want gold, there's probably a golden asteroid out there. Um, probably has vastly more gold than has is easy to mine from the crust of the earth. Um, of course, what it would do to gold as a, as a scarce uh, sort of economic resource, if somebody brought back a gold asteroid, I don't really know. But, um, uh, you know, the question of, of um, so, you know, there's one thing is, is can you go and um, uh, can you mine things? Of course, Mining is only useful if it isn't too expensive to bring the stuff back that you mined. But then there's the question of, I mean, I think that the more cynical folk might say, you know, the, the way to fund at least some uh, like robotic lunar missions um, is, you know, you sell the, the, the movie rights, so to speak. Um, and that, uh, you know, it, it's basically a branch of the entertainment industry. And up to a point, that's possible. But by the time you're doing missions to Mars, I, I don't think that really works. Um, the, uh, I think it's too expensive to be able to justify on the basis of um, any kind of uh, entertainment advertising uh, sponsorship type, type, type deal. You just, not enough uh, goods are sold around it to be able to justify having a whole spacecraft and Mars colony and so on. So the, the question that was asked here was about intellectual property, that is sort of ideas that are discovered through having a Mars colony. Um, it's an interesting question whether that would happen. I mean, that's certainly a, it hasn't really happened in, in, uh, in, in space so far in, you know, in Earth orbit. Um, a lot of things were developed as part of the space program, you know, the Apollo missions in the 1960s to land uh, people on the moon. Um, that was a, a huge and very impressive kind of rush engineering project that just involved just a lot of things had to be invented to make that possible. And I, you know, I know even from my own experiences of doing large engineering projects that the force of getting the large engineering project done creates a lot of inventiveness and a lot of things get, get produced that, are, uh, that go beyond the specifics of that particular engineering project. And that's exactly what happened with the space program. Um, all kinds of different funky things from freeze dried food to, uh, to some extent to microelectronics, although that was partly developed for other reasons too. Um, were were the result of of the Apollo um, program in the in the 1960s, and that was that was more the development of of inventions to support the process of making in in the case of what's being asked here in the future a Mars colony, rather than you go to Mars and on Mars the scientists there technologists there invent new things. There's there's that's a that's an interesting idea that that might happen. Um, I don't know. Uh, it's it's some um, I don't think that the I don't know how many uh, you know how many patent filings 
have been done where the address of the inventor is Antarctica? My guess is the answer is, well, it'd be interesting. It's easy to look up. But my guess is the answer might actually be zero. Um, and uh, so exactly how that would play out on, on Mars, I'm not sure. Okay. Um, oh boy, so many interesting questions. Um, let's see. Um, oh, there's a claim here that Latin had an arbitrary order. When, when I learned it in school, it was always subject to object verb. Um, and it's true that I think on inscriptions, I've seen other things. So that may be, that may be correct. Um, let's see. Okay, there's a question from Dominica. Um, do you have advice for teenagers who want to discover an, a new kind of science? Uh, the, um, so uh, uh, who want to, for example, make big discoveries in, in science or whatever else? Yeah, I mean, I probably do have some suggestions. Um, I suppose my first suggestion is the very idea that you can discover new things is not self-evident. I mean, in, in, I think most of us are born with the idea that we can discover new things, but when you go to school, the main thing you learn about is things that have already been discovered that you're supposed to uh, learn about. In other words, there is an existing body of knowledge and a lot of what's involved in school is, here's this body of knowledge, now go learn this. And the concept that new knowledge could be created is much less obvious. Um, and in fact, there's sort of a question of, uh, you know, a lot of knowledge has been accumulated in these few thousand years of our civilization. And uh, for the sake of kind of uh, leading a productive life, it's worth knowing a bunch of that knowledge. Um, the question is really, can you contribute to a significant moving of the needle of producing new knowledge? Well, the first thing you have to do is to start realizing that it's possible to produce new knowledge at all. Um, which is, as I say, not something you typically get in school. So, you know, a, a typical thing is you're learning about, I don't know, let's say math. Can you make new knowledge in math? Um, or is the math that you learn until you're in graduate school in math, all math that was done before, and you just have to learn it rather than you have any capability to make new knowledge in it? Well, I would claim that it's actually rather easy. You know, what, what typically happens is, any particular area has been well explored in the places where it's been explored, kind of goes without saying. But the question is how far off the track do you have to go before you get to things that haven't been explored? And is the reason that they haven't been explored that they're really hard to explore? Or is the reason just that nobody ever looked at that? Well, very often what you find is the reason nobody ever looked at that is because in a sense, paradoxically, nobody ever looked at that. Um, in, in, in the following sense, that people develop this idea, this is what one looks at in this particular area. So if there's this thing over here, oh, nobody looks at that, so one shouldn't look at that. You know, it's funny, I was just been working on a thing in connection with our physics project that's um, a bunch of essentially math uh, to do with uh, these things we call multi-way systems and multi-way systems operating on numbers and so on. And I'm like, why has nobody ever looked at this before? It's, I don't think anybody's looked at it before. It's possible they have. I don't think so. I think I know the literature well enough. It's, it's pretty elementary. It's not like it, it requires, uh, you know, okay, it's, it's got some things which can make use of some slightly more advanced math. Um, but uh, um, it's the question of why nobody's looked at it before. I think I'm getting some allergy here. The why nobody's looked at it before is, um, uh, is just because the things that would lead you to look at it didn't exist. They were the, the things that cause you to think that that might be interesting didn't exist. It's not that it's fundamentally hard to look at. So I would say in terms of discovering new things, the first step is, can you, can you ask questions that are uh, where you can make progress? And uh, you know, when I was a kid, 
I, I guess I didn't really get the message as clearly as I might that, you know, the only like physics you can do is the physics that's in exercises and books. Because I kind of like, well, there's a question. Let me see if I can answer that question. The fact that the answer isn't in any book that I know about and isn't, I, maybe there was an advantage back in those days that the web didn't exist. Because for me, it was often, do I know the answer to this question? No. Uh, is it in the book that I'm looking at? Well, no. Okay, how do I find out the answer to this question? Well, I could go and, you know, bicycle to the university library or something and go try and find it, or I could go try and figure it out myself. It might be a lot faster to try and figure it out myself. And so that's a, uh, uh, but, but also, you know, this, this realization that yes, you can figure things out yourself that aren't, haven't been figured out before is, is a really good one to have. Now, in modern times, the whole computational methodology is one that is sort of new to our time. And so once you know kind of a certain amount of the tools of computation, uh, there's just so much that can be figured out where people haven't have figured it out, not because it's hard, but because they never looked there, because they didn't have the tools, they didn't think about things that way and so on. So I think, you know, my number one suggestion is go try and figure out things. And, and I would say that it's, it's satisfying when you can figure them out in a very concrete way. You know, you write a program, it does this, you get a result, you can show it to people. And, you know, it's better than sort of having some generalized idea that you're sort of describing sort of more philosophically rather than concretely, because that's a lot harder to, um, uh, to, to really be sure you know what you're talking about for yourself and to communicate to other people. So I think this kind of uh, sort of actually do things, build new stuff, think about new questions, you know, a general strategy, okay? So for given a field, how do you figure out something new and interesting about that field? My slightly outrageous general strategy is, is more or less this. First question is, what is the central problem of the field? Right? Like take a field, I don't know, chemistry, let's say, right? We might say the central problem of chemistry is to make a molecule, make some form of molecule that does something useful, even just to construct a molecule with any given form or to make a molecule with any given property. You, know, you specify a property. I want my molecule to do this and that and to absorb light and do this and do this and do that. And then it's like, well, okay, how do I get, uh, you know, how do I make a molecule that does that? You can think of that maybe, I don't know if that, I just thought of this, I'm not sure it's quite, quite right, but you can think of that at least one of the sort of central problems of chemistry. Okay, so then we start thinking about, well, what can we say about that central problem? Uh, you know, people have been working on chemistry for a long time. There's tens of millions of, of chemical compounds that are known, that are cataloged, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, how can we make progress? Well, that general problem is really hard, but we can start thinking about, well, you know, if we start thinking about all the chemical reactions that exist, can we imagine what are all the possible ways we can, might be able to arrange chemical reactions? What would their outcomes be? Those kinds of things we can start thinking about. Oh, if we were going to build molecules sort of step by step, how would we make sort of molecule templates that would allow us to do that? I'm not sure these are, you know, these are all complicated things, but the, the point that I'm making is that given the central problem of a field, there are often ways into that central problem that have not been explored and which are, there'll be a set of things that have been explored. Those things will typically long, long ago have lost sight of the central problem. And so, Often, if you try and drill into the central problem, perhaps using new methods, new ideas, and so on, you may get somewhere. You probably won't solve the central problem, but you'll, you'll have made progress, and it's kind of a way to make sure that what you're doing is ultimately relevant to the field. Um, so anyway, that's a sort of a, 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 um, an approach. I mean, I, I would say that in general, the problem of discovering, for example, new science is is I would say first and foremost is a problem of asking the right questions. The, the difficulty of like, oh, can we figure out the answer given that we've really got the right question is much lower than the, than the difficulty of, you know, can we really formulate the right question? And formulating the right question is often a matter of sort of understanding how to think about a particular kind of problem. So for instance, um, 
oh, I don't know, like, like the, the thing I mentioned about chemistry, you know, how to think about that problem. Do we think about molecules and reactions in some kind of computational form, or do we think about it in terms of whether it's a white powdered chemical or something? Um, it's, uh, you know, the, the, um, it's, it's sort of a question of, of how, we, how we build up the framework to think about things. Um, but I would say that the, uh, uh, in terms of the original question about uh, sort of teenagers doing new science, um, it's like, go find some problems that uh, are problems that are not, uh, that are just your own idea, your own question. You know, I wonder about this. I wonder about that. If you wonder about it, don't assume that, oh, the answer's already known. Somebody must have figured that out. Don't assume that because it often isn't true. I mean, I, I'm, uh, you know, in, in fields that I'm not necessarily, you know, I've never worked on, I'll often wonder about the answer to some question and I'll usually file it away as I, I kind of wonder about this. And then sometime I'll run into, you know, the world expert on that field. And then I'll say, oh, by the way, I was wondering about, and I'll ask them this question. And I would say, uh, oh, probably, I would say half of the time, uh, they say, no, that's a, that's a reasonable question. Nobody knows the answer. And the other half of the time they'll say, oh yeah, yeah, we know the answer. Um, sometimes they'll say, we just figured it out this year. And sometimes they'll say, oh no, that, that was known a hundred years ago. Um, so it's, it's really a, a, a wide range and you, you shouldn't assume to, uh, you know, that, that the answer is known immediately. And that's a good, uh, good setup for any questions people want to ask here. And I can try and tell you whether I, um, um, uh, whether I, whether I know the answer or not. Okay. Um, question from Starman. How do I feel about academia versus um, self-made people? Is there a place, place for natural self-taught talent? You know, I mean, at some level, I would consider myself sort of self-taught, except that I went to, uh, you know, top schools and so on, and I, I learned lots of things there. Most of the things that I actually, uh, that are central to the things I've done in my life, I didn't learn in school. You know, I learned things like Latin and Greek, and I learned um, uh, a certain amount of math, and I learned, um, I learned, I, I suppose I learned a bunch of stuff about writing, English, and so on um, in school. I didn't learn anything about, uh, you know, a lot of kinds of science that I've worked on, technology, and so on. I, I didn't, never learned those things in school. I learned all those things by just learning them myself. Now, it probably helped that I had learned things in school and I'd learned a certain amount about how to learn, so to speak. Plus, the things that I learned in school have actually turned out to be very useful to me, um, pretty much all of them in, in some, at some time or another. So, uh, you know, there's sort of a question of to what extent one is going to learn things for oneself, to what extent one needs, uh, you know, it's, it's useful to sort of learn the standard things that are known. So a thing to say, uh, you know, the idea of I'm just going to figure out everything for myself. I'm not going to leverage any existing knowledge. That's a mistake. You know, our civilization has come a long way. We've learned a lot of stuff. And it's, uh, you know, if, if you say, I'm just going to figure out physics from scratch and just ignore everything that's known in physics, let me figure out everything from scratch. Probably not a good idea. There's a lot that's known that's, that's really worthwhile. Um, the, the, now, often, uh, you know, for me, for example, I've ended up, being involved in sort of re trying to rewrite the foundations of some fields. But I have to say, I think I've done my homework pretty well in those fields typically. I mean, I typically know what's known and I have to sometimes say, well, I'm going to ignore part of what's known, but I do know what's known. And um, it's, it's not one of these things which like, oh, I don't understand what's known, so I'm going to invent it all for myself. It's more like do your homework, know what's known, and then decide if you like it or not and whether you want to change the foundations or, or not. So I would say that, that sometimes when people talk about sort of self-taught, they mean, um, uh, you know, don't learn any of the existing knowledge. I think that's a mistake um, in terms of, you know, do you go through the sort of the, the, uh, the apparatus of the standard education system? You know, that's a challenge sometimes, and it's particularly a challenge for people who are uh, really quite creative thinkers because that's not what the education system is mostly about. The education system is mostly about uh, kind of this, this structured track that has certain sort of uh, 
uh, that, that involves, you know, I mean, sometimes it's like, should you go to this college? Well, will you fit into this college? Okay, you may fit into this college, but that doesn't necessarily mean that, uh, you know, fitting into the college is not the same thing as saying you'll have the most brilliant innovative insights. It means you're fitting into some existing framework. Um, and I think that the, uh, so it is sometimes a challenge for, uh, you know, if, if one is, is going to do things in a sort of a very creative way, it's, it's a challenge to sort of navigate through the, the, um, uh, the educational system sometimes and, and not to get to the point where one is so sort of bored and frustrated by the fact that, oh, I'm having to do the same thing. I'm not able to do something innovative and creative. So I think it's important, you know, people, uh, particularly I would say in the K through 12 education system, uh, people make themselves so busy these days. I mean, it's like, you know, I think of myself, you know, I spend my time running companies, doing science, writing things, all that kind of stuff. You might think I would be a busy person. And, you know, yes, I have a, a heavily scheduled life and so on. But somehow it seems like many of the teenagers I know are vastly busier than I am. And um, uh, or at least have the, have the project the image of being vastly busier than I am. Um, and, you know, I think sometimes think that's a pity because, uh, you know, it's like they're doing this, 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 this. But it's like, OK, but, you know, you might just, you know, block off some time and use it to think and use it to do some project that you just think is interesting. It does. It's not necessarily a project that leads to this, that leads to that, that leads to that, that leads to that. Um, it's a project that you want to do because it's interesting. And may turn out if you do the project because it's interesting, you discover something really interesting that um, that other people think is really cool. It may also turn out that nobody else cares, but you like it yourself, and that's a good thing too. Um, and I think that uh, uh, you know part of this. Um, I would say you know make sure you leave some time to do stuff you're actually interested in, not stuff you're doing for the sake of some particular track that you're on that will lead to the next track that you're on that will lead to the next track and so on. I mean, I would say that in my life, if I look at a lot of the things I've done, uh, many of the things I've done started as quotes hobbies. I mean, back, you know, I was a professor at one point and I sort of had a hobby of doing things in the technology industry. And then pretty soon I was a technology industry CEO and I kind of had a hobby of doing science. And pretty soon I was doing that in a, in a sort of for real, so to speak. Um, I've had, uh, uh, it is a, uh, you know, even, even doing things like writing, I've sort of done as a hobby and, and then it ends up, but, you know, I publish books and things, um, you know, for me, uh, doing it kind of as a hobby frees me to do it on my terms. And, uh, it often then turns into something very serious, so to speak. Um, and I think that's a thing that's a pretty good dynamic for, for everybody. It's like, okay, there's a track you're on where you can see the next step of the next step, the next step, but just do something that's, that's fun and do it well and it may turn out it usually will turn out that um and sometimes it's it, it you know you do the thing you do it well and then you say well does the world care about this thing well maybe it's not obvious the world cares about this thing maybe you have to be a little bit innovative to find out how to uh sort of how to present the thing to the right part of the world to make sure that it cares about it i mean i i'm kind of reminded of i you know people who are poets for example and it's like, you know, and they, they were like, uh, how do I get a job doing, you know, doing poetry? And then Twitter came along and they realized that um, the skills that they knew from writing poetry uh, were really good. If you want to be a, you know, a commercial Twitterer, so to speak, um, that was a really useful skill for that. All right. Lots of questions. Um, uh, um, boy, let's see. Um, so many questions here. Um, let's see. Um, okay, a few few questions here I'll try to address. Um, the question from this is Pratik. Do you think language is evolutionarily inevitable, an inevitable feature of consciousness? And if you find sentient life, will you find a language that the consciousness communicates in? Um, as a corollary, given a language, can you find a consciousness behind it? I'm not sure I'm going to be able to do, really do this question justice. Um, 
I think this sort of requires, I mean, we were talking about a little bit earlier, is um, uh, the question of the relationship between language and thinking, so to speak. It's a, it's a long running uh, philosophical discussion. Um, I think that um, um, the, I mean, the main feature of language as we know it today is it is a way of communicating abstract ideas, abstracted from their specifics. And is that related to the existence of minds and so on? It's certainly something not far away. Um, do we have the, the imagination to see what other forms of abstract communication could exist between minds? I don't think that we do. And whether language is the only one is not clear. Whether symbolic language is the only one is not clear, at least not to me. Um, uh, that is a sort of a way of communicating abstracted thoughts. What is an abstracted thought? I, that's a kind of a high level of abstraction, the abstraction of abstraction. Um, maybe that's not appropriate for this for this group. Okay, there's a question here about um, Tom, from Thomas, saying as a physics teacher, what's my opinion about physics teaching today? Uh, I, am, I am too far away from the details of what's being done to have a very informed opinion. Um, I would say, I make a few comments though. One of the challenges sometimes in teaching is to know, you know, what concepts are really, really within range and what concepts are too hard. And sometimes the what's within range and what's too hard is somehow deduced from history. People say, if it took humans hundreds of years to figure that out, it must be too hard to teach to kids. That's not always the case. It is true that many fields build themselves up sequentially, like for example, in mathematics, a certain amount of the development from arithmetic to algebra to calculus and so on, that recapitulates history. Um, but there are other things that don't, like decimals were invented very late in history. Uh, things like binary numbers uh, were invented but not really taken seriously until very recently. There are, and, and the idea of computation and programmability is a very recent idea. It's an idea from after the 1930s. It's an idea that could have been had hundreds of years earlier but wasn't. But that idea is actually not a hard idea to understand. And it would be a mistake to say, in order to, pe people did this actually in the early days of sort of computer science. Some people said, if you want to understand how to write a computer program, first you have to understand mathematical logic and you have to understand um, the idea of, you know, beta reduction and lambda calculus or something before you can ever use a variable in a, uh, um, in a function, so to speak. Um, the, uh, uh, but, Turns out that's not necessary. So there are these places where the historical development of a subject does not map into what can readily be taught. Uh, you know, there were things which were sort of uh, uh, not necessarily glitches of history. There were things where it seemed like a tower of abstraction was needed um, that, uh, uh, that in fact is not. Now, part of the reason that happens is because our ambient experience of the world changes. So for example, in modern times, we ambiently understand a lot about computers because computers are everywhere. Um, if one had gone back and said, we're gonna teach physics using computation as a core component, we're gonna teach that 100 years ago, it's like, forget it, it's not, a, it's not a real thing because computation as it's now understood just didn't exist then. So, you know, first thing to say is there are things that, that one can teach in physics. I don't know what favorite example is particle physics. There are aspects of particle physics that are really elementary to teach. You know, protons have three quarks in them more or less. You know, there are W bosons, they're the carriers of the weak, weak force, so all these kinds of things. These can be taught at almost the same level uh, as, a, as a sort of phenomenological level that doesn't require you to understand the, the mathematics of fiber bundles and local gauge invariants and so on. They can be taught as something that's just sort of interesting to know about the world. That's, that's one thing to say. Another thing I would say about, about physics today is the ability to have sort of data taken by devices and go directly onto your computer, you know, use Wolfram language, use notebooks and things, you know, create an analysis of that data. You too can discover all kinds of physical laws, either from data that you can directly take yourself um, or that data from data that you can readily get uh, from the world. Um, you can sort of rediscover Kepler's laws if you're doing things with, uh, you know, with planets, or you can rediscover, you know, parabolic motion uh, from videos, things like that. And it's rather easy to do that at this point. And, and that's something I think uh, might be interesting. Um, in terms of um, uh, sort of traditional, uh, okay, so, so here's a good exercise. Now that we think we understand sort of what 
quantum mechanics, where quantum mechanics comes from, can we teach it better? The answer is, I think, most definitely yes. Um, have, we, have we completely figured out how to do that? Not quite. Uh, getting closer. I think we will have a much cleaner way to describe quantum mechanics. You know, can we describe things like general relativity in a clean way? Yes, the answer is yes. We, we have nice clean ways to do that now. You know, do I recommend that every physics class teaches about um, uh, sort of the, the continuum limit of hypergraph rewriting? Probably not yet. Um, although, you know, there will come a time when it's worthwhile, uh, you know, once some, uh, you know, people talk about what's matter made of, or you certainly say it's made of atoms, what's space made of, um, hopefully, before too many years have gone by, you know, the atoms of space will be a thing that one can reasonably talk about as, uh, as something in learning physics. Um, gosh, so many things. Uh, let's see. Oh, there's a question. There so many questions here. You guys are just asking so many interesting things. Um, okay, there's a question here about what's my take on autonomous cars and how long until they become feasible? Autonomous cars are difficult, more difficult than you might imagine. I mean, there are situations in which they're fairly easy. You're driving down a freeway, the thing is well mapped, there are no obstructions. Uh, it's just a question of following the lane and not running into the car in front of you. That's a solvable problem. The full problem of a city street with everything that's going on and um, all these um, kinds, of, uh, kinds of things that happen, that's a very hard problem. And it's not clear, there are, you know, there are even fairly fundamental questions like you know, you're merging into a lane of traffic. You are looking as a human, you look at the other human in the car next to you, say, are they gonna let me in? Are they not gonna let me in? How do you figure that out? Um, are you, uh, can you in fact merge into another lane of traffic without taking a risk? Do you have to assert yourself and just start moving and know that the other humans will pull back? Um, it's, uh, you know, and if you, uh, now, as soon as you start having many cars being autonomous and cars, autonomous cars being able to communicate with autonomous cars, again, that becomes an easier problem. So, so if, for example, every car on the road was autonomous, I suspect that's a problem that can be solved. I think the problem of, uh, uh, of sort of well-defined lanes, well-defined environments where you can make uh, do autonomous driving, that I think is a very solvable problem um, and has been to some extent solved already. Um, the problem of kind of the, the free range, sort of drive anywhere, deal with uh, all the kinds of situations that can happen, this seems to me to be a very hard problem. And people talk about you know, level one, level two, level three autonomy and so on. And sometimes it's kind of a bit of a bit of a put up job because you know people have this particular area around Mountain View or whatever, very, very carefully mapped out. And it's like, you know, every piece of that and then it becomes a bit easier. And, and you also know, oh gosh, there wasn't, you know, that thing wasn't there in that intersection yesterday. You know, let me be more careful here, so to speak. So there are there's sort of little slights of hand in a sense that, that, that happen there. I mean, there are also very practical things like LIDAR, um, laser radar, so to speak, those things that you see, those big, those big uh, sort of um, uh, round things you see on the top of self-driving cars, those have uh, spinning laser things in them that are mapping out the three-dimensional environment around the car. Uh, traditionally, those things have been rather expensive and complicated. There will be much cheaper ones of those, and that will surely help in being able to give a, a beyond human view of what's around a car fully in three dimensions and so on. And that helps in being able to make decisions. But you know, I think a good test case is what are the most exotic things that happen when one's driving and can one figure out what to do? And uh, you know, I, I, I sometimes hear from people who work on autonomous cars and I, I was asking the question at one point, if you're doing quality assurance for an, uh, autonomous cars, that is, can you, you know, the quality assurance involves testing. What happens if this happens? What happens if that happens? What happens if it's in the snow? What happens if this, whatever? So what's the most exotic thing you've seen? And I think uh, uh, one person told me that uh, one of the things they saw was a situation where autonomous car comes up to a place in the road where there's a, a woman on one of those kind of ride around um, uh, wheelchair-like 
things, but, but not quite a wheelchair. And there were some ducks in the middle of the road and the woman was circling around the ducks um, to protect them from oncoming traffic. And it's like, what is that? Says the autonomous car. You know, what is going on here? There are ducks, there's a person, there's a person that's circling around in the middle of the road. What's going on? And you know, that's a hard thing. How do you, how do you give the autonomous car information of what to do in that situation? It's not, um, uh, you know, it has to have, at some level, it either just has to say, oh, I give up, you know, beep, 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 have the human take over um, or something. So I, you know, I, I suspect it's a hard problem. I, I think it's um, um, uh, the, as I say, uh, it's a it's a problem that has some sort of societal pieces. Like if you if you carve off sort of special lanes for self driving cars, then that's a lot easier. And if you say this whole environment is pure self driving, then that's easier. And you know, people try to do things like they say, let's have a self driving setup where the thing is only making right-hand turns or it's only turning in this way. And, you know, you might have to go a little bit further on the roads, but it's going to be easier because it's completely, it doesn't have to deal with any weird, complicated left turn into oncoming traffic and, and things like that situation. And, and that's another kind of approach to doing it. But I think it's a, I think it's a fairly difficult problem to solve in general. And like, like a lot of engineering problems, um, solving a partial version of the problem that is still very, very useful to people is, is, a, is a good solution. And it's still very useful if you can, you know, drive autonomously on a, on a highway, on a freeway, you know, if you can drive a truck autonomously on a freeway and things, it's a very, very useful thing, even if you haven't solved the full problem for, for arbitrary driving. Uh, let's see. There's a question from Nick here. Uh, books for curious teens wanting to learn about science. I have to recommend my own new kind of science book and particularly the notes in the back of that book, which I was, I, I keep on re-encountering notes that I wrote there, which I, I think are, are, it's like, I look at a page on Wikipedia and then I look at the note that I wrote about the thing and it's like, well, maybe it's just because I wrote the note that's clearer, clearer to me, but it's like, I think there's a much clearer description of what's going on. So I, I would recommend you can find that book online. Um, that's one thing I would recommend. Um, it's, uh, gosh, um, you know, I would recommend, I mean, you know, the elementary textbooks or the, the college 101 textbooks of many fields have, have often been very well laid out. They're very, you know, they're very well presented and a lot of effort has been put into them. And, uh, uh, you know, sometimes they may be a little dry but um, nevertheless, you know, flipping through their pages and looking at the box on this page, the thing on that page, it's a, it's a good idea. You can ignore all of the structured exercises and so on if you just want to get an idea of what's going on. But I think it's a, it's a, it's a good way. You know, a lot of effort has been putting, put into making those kinds of things a sort of bird's eye view of, of their field. And, and I, I guess I would recommend that as a general approach. Um, Let's see. Uh, somebody's commenting that the, the self-driving car uh, uh, QA example was AI meets untitled goose. Yeah, that's some. Um, um, okay, there's a question here. Um, okay, there's a question here from Student doctor, how do you go about building a team around you to solve the problems you want to work on? Oh boy, that's a challenging question. Um, you know, I think, what's a good answer to that? That's at all generalizable. I mean, I've been very fortunate that over the years, because we have a company that makes products that are well-known, well-used by lots of people, lots of interesting folk sort of come into our orbit somehow. They use our products, they interact with us in some way or another, we get to know them. And then when there's a project coming along, it's like, gosh, who do we know who might be really interested and really good at this project? So I would say that the, I, actually, I, yes, let me, let, me, let me say it this way. I would say for me, the number one thing is having a, a good network myself of, of people I know um, who know about lots of different kinds of things. And even when 
the particular thing they know about isn't something that I have a specific reason to care about right then. It's just like, you know, keep in touch because, you know, some year, some decade, there may be something, you know, if you find the person interesting and you find what they do interesting, even if it's not specifically connected to what you're doing right now, it's like maybe it will be in 10 years. Um, I think that's been an important thing for me. I mean, I would say that it's been a source of both, uh, um, both personal, uh, I would say, a personally good thing and a good thing sort of in terms of uh, the development of, of things I've done uh, in the practical world that, you know, I just have a very big network of people that I know and I keep, keep in touch with people. I mean, I'm in touch with a decent fraction of the people I knew in, well, certainly elementary school and, and even to some extent uh, kindergarten. Uh, which is a long, depressingly long time ago for me now. But, and I think these days it's probably easier to stay in touch because people are like on social media and things like this. Um, but uh, it's like, stay in touch. And you, you find out, you know, one of the terrible things is, you know, I, I recently uh, went to an elementary school reunion and saw some people I hadn't seen in 50 years. And I realized that, you know, you start talking to them and it feels like, you know, you just start the conversation where you left off 50 years ago. And you, you know, you've had a lot of experience in between, but you're still the same people and it still sort of works the same way. So I, I would say that part of it is, is just um, uh, sort of having a network of people you know, then, you know, you can always go, uh, you know, there are places to sort of find people and so on. Then there's a the question, when you build a team for something, what, you know, how do you make the team really do stuff? And I would say that if you're leading a team and somebody has to lead it, 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 you know, I, I have almost never seen a, a serious innovative project happen without leadership. And so what is the role of the leader? The number one role of the leader is to define the vision and to, to convince people that what you're proposing to do is actually possible. I mean, I think that, um, uh, you know, a lot of what I've spent my time doing is convincing teams of people that what we're trying to do is not impossible. And the, and the typical pattern is this. I'll say, I have this idea. We're going to build Wolfram Alpha, for example. People say, oh, it's impossible. There's too much of this. It's too hard to understand natural language. It's too, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So then, you know, I'll let people work on it a bit and then say, okay. They say, oh, it's just not possible. Okay, why isn't it possible? Tell me what's not possible. Okay, we can't solve this problem. We can't solve that problem. Say, so, okay, let's work on this problem. Let me try and help you solve that problem. Okay, you bash on it for a while and they say, oh, yeah. Yeah, I guess we can solve that problem. That's cool. And now we can go on and take the next step. So a lot of the leadership of projects has to do with, in my experience, has to do with defining what the goals are, then sort of, uh, sort of convincing people that those things are possible. And it's no good to just say, it's possible, go solve the problem. You've got to be involved in solving the problem yourself as well. Um, I think the other point is sometimes what you have defined to do simply isn't possible. And Usually, what's the case of what I've found it essentially always in projects I've done is even if the thing you at first defined is sort of hitting a hard place where you just, just can't do it, you can redefine the objectives a little bit to still achieve a large part of what you wanted to do, or maybe even a better objective than you originally had, and that project is possible. And so that's an, another piece to the picture of sort of how do you, uh, you know, how do you lead such a team? Now, you know, what can happen is when you try and assemble teams of people, the, um, you know, one of the challenges is why are people doing this? You know, everybody does stuff for some internal reason. And your role as a leader of the team is to define why it's exciting to do something, why it's worth doing something, why people should value doing that thing. And, you know, how to think about the thing so that it is something that people will, the people who are doing it will value doing. I think that's an important thing. Now, sometimes, you know, you try and assemble a team and there's somebody who really wants to do something different. Well, they probably won't fit in your team. And if you try and make them fit, it'll be super frustrating and um, they'll, um, uh, uh, you know, and, 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 and they'll sort of distort the project. You know, I was talking to um, uh, some kids I, I interact with recently and uh, was talking to them about leading projects and about the question of, um, if you're doing like a joint project with, with other kids in school and the other kids just don't, won't do what you want, what do you do? And, um, uh, you know, I, I was saying that I think everybody has a different personality for managing P 
people and things. Not everybody is necessarily so cut out for telling other people what to do. Um, it's, uh, but turns out more people than you might think can do that. Even people who you might think of as very sort of mousy and retiring, people you might think of as very sort of loud and outgoing. You know, there are many different personalities that can, can lead people and, and there are different ways to lead people. I mean, in my particular, my particular approach is more about sort of uh, lead by defining objectives and creating enthusiasm, so to speak. Other people have a more structured way of leading and where they, where they help people to understand this is the exact next step you should take. This is the next step, this is the next step. They provide a very structured setup, which a lot, many people find a, a, a much easier thing to sort of pursue. I mean, there are people, another thing to say is, when you build a team, you, the leader of the team, have to, there will be certain people that can work with you and there's certain people who can't work with you. And it's not that the people are bad people or good people, it's just, do they fit with you or not? So for me, there are types of people who can work well with me and I can work well with them. And there are types of people where I drive them crazy, they drive me crazy. You know, I know that they're not people where, where there's a good fit there. And not that they're not, you know, I, I can say sometimes I'll say to somebody, look, you know, you will be a great fit working for a large company that has, you know, hundreds of thousands of employees. You're not going to be, uh, you know, a good fit working for a company that has 800 employees. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's a different, different kinds of things that, that go on. There's different level of structure that exists there. And it's the same with any project, whether it's, you know, a project done in school with kids or whether it's a, a project you're trying to do that's building some piece of technology for the world. Um, there'll be people who are uh, sort of a fit for the environment that you have and the leadership that you can provide and there are people who are not. Um, and, you know, learning how to recognize that is very useful. I mean, I think that, you know, in my own experience, um, the, uh, uh, you know, if, I, if I'm trying to sort of interact with somebody, interview them, figure out are they going to be a good fit for my team, my project, whatever, you know, what I like to be able to do is, is say after I've talked to the person, I think I know this person well enough now that if I imagine for myself a question, what would the person do if such and such a situation arose that I think I can answer that question? If I can't answer the question, if I say I just have no idea, I couldn't figure that out, then typically it's kind of not promising to uh, for me to work with that person just in terms of the way that that I tend to do things but anyway I can uh, discussing management is probably a different different topic um the uh, um let's see uh, okay someone is asking here about um business oh there's all kinds of questions here what's the future of fiat currency Questions about business. Sorry, let me take the one about business and then one, the one about um, uh, fiat currency. So there's a question here from um, uh, I see. You know, I've seen this handle before, and I got to figure out how to pronounce it. I'll call it I see. Um, the question is about business knowledge, and um, uh, you know, okay. So so I've started basically two companies in my life. First one when I was about 21 years old, the second one when I was about 26 years old. I'm still running the one I started when I was 26 years old. I mean, it's actually multiple companies, but conceptually it's, it's um, kind of one, one initiative uh, or from research. Um, and um, so, you know, I would say that um, uh, there are, uh, again, there are different ways to have a business and to run a business, and they're very different personalities. You know, it's it's funny when if you meet up with a gathering of of people who run businesses, entrepreneurs, people. Well, th those are two different things. People. There are people who start businesses, and there are people who run businesses but may not have started businesses. Different different collections of people. Um, but particularly, if you look at the people who start businesses and run them, um, it's a very diverse collection of people from the, the very people-oriented people to the very nerdy people to the very intellectual people to the very kind of salesy people to the people where it's like where they're very eloquent and they can give a big speech to the people who can barely string words together. Just a very wide range of people, um, very wide range of backgrounds, very wide range of personalities. And they all have the thing in common that they've started a built 
successful companies. You know, so there are different ways into doing it. Uh, and there are different goals that people have. I mean, for some people, like for me, the company is sort of all about the products we build. Uh, for other people, it's all about making money, for example, uh, or it's all about kind of um, the, uh, uh, or, it's, or it's sort of specifically about the set of people you're working with. I, I like very much the set of people I work with. And for me, that's important. But in a sense, the, the, the number one thing for me is sort of the intellectual development of products and so on. Um, the, uh, I think that, um, you know, the first thing to think about in terms of companies is, you know, make a company that you care about, so to speak. You know, people sometimes have this idea that, oh, I'll make a company because it'll be successful, even though I don't really care about the thing it makes. I don't really care about what it's doing. I mean, you know, there are people who have companies. It's, it's kind of funny for me. Sometimes I'll meet somebody, the CEO of some company, and the company makes some, you know, very technical thing. I'll ask about it. And it's completely clear the person does not care about the technical thing. What the person cares about is the mechanism for selling the technical thing, which itself is very interesting. No question about it. I mean, you can be interested in that. It's not my primary interest, but, but that's a thing in itself. You know, it's something where it's like, it's not so much about the product. It's about, you know, the way we deliver the product. It's about the service that we provide to customers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's a perfectly valid thing to be interested in, but it's different from necessarily being interested in the product on its own. Um, so, you know, that, that's, that's one thing. I, I would say that anybody who says, I've got a scheme, I've got some kind of, I've got this magic idea that's going to, you know, make money, solve the problems of the world. Schemes never work out. It's, you know, maybe I have a, an overly puritanical view of this, but, but um, I, you know, in what I've seen, it's, it's hard work to build something real. And, and, and it's never, there are almost never kind of little free rides where, where you know, oh, it's just, it's just with this one clever idea and then everything sort of falls into place. It's hard work. And, and by the way, when people sort of sign up for starting companies and things, it's a, you know, it's not something you do as, uh, as kind of a, oh, I'm going to do this one hour a week type thing. Um, now, you know, having said that, there's sort of a tendency, I think it's a little bit dying off these days, but there was a period of time when it's like, everybody should be a tech entrepreneur. You know, it's like, and there were classes about, you know, how to make your minimum viable product, how to give your elevator pitch. You know, all these terms, for me, it's kind of amusing because I've been in the tech industry long enough that I, I remember when all those concepts were introduced of sort of the minimal viable products and so on. And now, you know, sometimes I've been visiting in different places around the world and I'll, I'll visit some high school or something and people will be talking about, you know, on the whiteboard, they'll have all this stuff for high school kids about, you know, minimum viable product, elevator pitch, you know, uh, whatever. And I, I, it's kind of interesting that that's sort of been a consumerized idea for sort of this, this idea of entrepreneurism for everybody. Now, you know, it is, entrepreneurism is an interesting thing to learn about. It's an interesting way of viewing the world, but it is not for everybody. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I think that it is, um, and it isn't the right way to think about every project that gets done. I mean, it's like people uh, over time invent all of these magic, this is the way to think about projects. So for example, um, Oh, I don't know, like in, in, in software development, there are these things like everything has to be object oriented. Everything has to be done with agile. Everything has to be done with whatever. And sometimes these things have an almost, you know, uh, kind of a strange, almost cult-like character of like, everybody has to have a stand up meeting. It's very important people be standing for this amount of time. Um, you know, now, you know, these things work for some people and don't work for other people. It's, um, you know, I, along these lines of sort of the standardized way to do things, there was a, a scheme, it was, it was big in the Soviet Union actually at one point called TRIZ. I don't know what that stands for, it's probably in Russian. Um, but anyway, it was a, it was a, a meta, it was an, a, a, a scheme for inventing things, okay? So it was a very, I mean, I think in the Soviet Union it was very big on kind of these very structured, you know, we will make this five-year plan, we will do this, everything is very planned, everything's very structured. So the question is, how do you do innovation? How do you do structured innovation? Okay, so there's a scheme for doing structured innovation, and it's a procedure for innovating. And, um, you know, the procedure works by basically saying, uh, you imagine, you look at patents that describe inventions, and you say, there's a patent that means this, there's a patent that means that, and then there's, you know, there's one patent that does this on, 
I don't know, optics. And there's another pattern that does this on electrical systems. So there must be something in between that is sort of does that on the other, the other kind of system or whatever. So it's sort of a, and you know, like all these things, it, it has the feature that, yeah, it, it has some good ideas, but it is not the whole story for this is the grand machine that's going to lead to all innovation. And, and nor is entrepreneurism, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But, but you know, so, you know, things about business. I mean, I think that um, uh, if you're making products, not every business is about making products, but um, I mean, I, I'd say the first thing is do a business that you enjoy. The idea of doing a business that you don't enjoy, uh, or particularly starting one is kind of crazy. Um, and uh, although there will be pieces that are really hard work and you may not locally enjoy them. Um, I think that the, another thing that I've noticed about business is, uh, you know, engage the thinking apparatus on all issues. And, you know, don't just assume, again, there are different ways to run companies, okay? So I should say that. So some people, when they run a company, they say, okay, I'm the CEO, and I'm just going to get in experts who know about this and this and this and this and this, and I'm just going to be the conductor of the orchestra, so to speak. And each, you know, I'll get the, the public relations person, I'll get the, uh, uh, the, the DevOps person, I'll get the, this person, I'll get the, that person, I'll get the developer, I'll get all these kinds of things. And I put them all together and then something wonderful will happen, but I don't understand any of those areas. Um, and uh, for me, that's completely different from the way I've, I've always done things. I find that very hard to understand how people could do that, how they can sort of be the conductor without understanding the pieces. Uh, for me, you know, my theory of companies tends to be on day one, the CEO does everything. And gradually, as you understand more and more about how things work, you can hire people who do things at least as well, if not better than you do those particular things. Um, and that has the, you know, it has the feature that for my company, for most areas, I can kind of dive in and uh, actually do the work on the ground. Pretty much every area where I can't, we probably have not historically done as well as other areas. Um, and so for me, at least, it's sort of understanding things uh, through and through is really important to, to being able to, to make business. You know, I, this is supposed to be for, mostly for kids, so I'm going to I'm going to stop yakking about business here. I can talk about business some other time. There's there's lots to say about about sort of um, how to think about um, uh, at least my view of how to think about business, how to think about innovation in business, and so on. Um, let's see. Uh, okay. Oh, there was a question here. What's the future of fiat currency? So first I should explain what that means. So fiat currency is the stuff we, we all use as money, dollars, euros, yen, whatever. Um, there's sort of this new and different idea about making uh, currencies, which is digital currencies. Um, Bitcoin was the first example from 2009, um, 2009. Um, and uh, there, are, there are now a whole plethora of other examples. So, so what's the difference between fiat currency? So, so what is Bitcoin? Bitcoin is purely electronic, purely digital money, where you can say, I have some number of Bitcoin, I can pay you in Bitcoin for something, and you can pay me, and there's this whole sort of ecosystem of, of purely, uh, purely digital money. And there's a whole mechanism which I could describe a little bit of about how so-called cryptocurrencies work um, and, how, uh, and how you sort of secure, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the ways that cryptocurrencies work is at some level there is a ledger, there's a, there's a record of who owns exactly how much Bitcoin. Now, you don't know who the actual individual people are, you just know some address, but, um, so you don't know who owns the money, but you know address number such and such owns this amount of Bitcoin. And it's, it's completely known for the whole history of Bitcoin. Every transaction is logged. In fact, in Wolfram language, you can just go and say, uh, you know, blockchain transaction data of some transaction ID for the Bitcoin blockchain. You can pull up any transaction that ever happened on the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, and so that's kind of the way that you know that somebody has certain assets is because there's a ledger that just says this person has these assets. It's a little bit like the way that, you know, if you say, who owns that house? Um, there's ultimately a, a title registry where somewhere there's a conceptually at least a piece of paper that says this is the person that owns that house. Okay, so uh, in, in the case of, um, 
of fiat currency, um, the, uh, uh, oh, and, and, and there's sort of a question of, of okay, so then, then a big question is, why is Bitcoin valuable? Why does somebody say, I can buy a cup of coffee for this number of Satoshi, which is a, a tiny unit of, of Bitcoin? Um, it's, um, uh, you know, why can I, why is, uh, why is my cup of coffee worth, what is, I don't know the current conversion rate, 10 Satoshi or something? Um, it's, um, you know, what, what is the thing that is the producer of value for Bitcoin? After all, you know, we know who owns it, but why is any of this stuff worth anything? And that's a sort of key question in, in sort of the theory of money is why is it worth anything? And fundamentally, the answer is it's worth something because people think it's worth something. I mean, by the time people think that if they exchange their cup of coffee, if they sell you a cup of coffee for 10 Satoshi, and they have that 10 Satoshi and they think, oh, that 10 Satoshi is worth something because they can go to somebody else and they can buy a muffin for the 10 Satoshi or something, then, uh, then you know, then that's because everybody believes it's worth something. So, so there's sort of a question of, of how does that really work? How does value get generated for money? And um, for, for sort of people have been, you know, that's been a confusing thing through history. So back in the day, you know, the reason money was worth something was because the physical coins were worth something. They were made of gold or silver. And why was gold or silver worth something? Well, they were scarce and people, and when things are scarce, people are prepared to pay the people that they, they represent something that uh, uh, people that, that has sort of value to people. And because it's a scarce thing, it sort of maintains that value. So, so back in the day, the, the coins themselves were made of gold and silver. And you could actually say, this coin, I can give you this coin in return for a pig. And that coin is a lump of gold. And this lump of gold is definitely worth something because, because everybody knows that gold is worth something. It's scarce. And I can go and, and buy uh, you know, uh, some food for my, for my other pigs or something with that, with that money. OK, so then there was a as sort of things developed in history, uh, really in the last hundred years, actually, the, this, this idea of a sort of uh, a gold standard for, you know, this, uh, okay, so, okay, the, the, the next big thing was, you know, who issues the money? How does that work? Well, governments issue the money. They provide, so roll back a little bit. Simplest way to run an economy is just barter for things. You say, I'll exchange a pig, for a bunch of barley, and you'll get. And I'll exchange this, you know, fixing your roof for a uh, for a hamster, or you know, whatever it is. It's all just barter, and there doesn't have to be any sort of abstract medium. It's a little bit like we're talking about symbolic language and things. Money is the kind of abstract medium of value that is where you say, you know, you don't have to have, you don't have to exchange a, a you know, the barley for a pig. You can exchange money, abstract money, for the pig. Okay, so why does that make sense? Well, it has to be the case that this abstract money should be something that um, uh, that everybody recognizes has value of a certain a certain level of value. Now, it is not self-evident that money that there's a that you can have a single thing called money, so to speak. It could be the case that uh, economies would not have something that's a sort of a medium that can be exchanged for everything. It could be the case that you know, you buy food with one kind of thing. There's one sort of token that represents, you know, that's for getting things with food. And there's a completely different token that's for buying, I don't know, access to movies or something. Um, and in a sense, whenever people are trying to, you know, get you to get, you know, a, a, a um, uh, some kind of special card that's, uh, you know, sells you credits for some, for some particular goods or whatever, or some particular company, that's sort of breaking away from the idea of money as a universal medium of value. But what has turned out to be the case is that for economies, that there is a meaningful uniform medium of value that we can think of as being this thing we call money. So then the question is what, you know, how does that work? How does money, um, how does it maintain its value? What happens, you know? Uh, so, so there was a time when money was always exchangeable for gold. Where you said, well, gold has value, 
And we kind of know how much value it has because kind of roughly there's a certain amount of gold in the world, there's a certain number of people that sort of defines the value because of the amount of gold and the number of people and so that everybody can have only this amount and so on and so on and so on. That sort of is a way of maintaining a constancy of value. But um, uh, you know, after a while, it became impractical to do that. And, and for example, when paper money came into existence, people realized, well, actually the, the exchangeability for this tangible gold doesn't make any sense. It's just a piece of paper. And we can use that piece of paper to say it's promising somebody. So, so for example, I'm, I'm trying to remember what the American dollars say. I know that the British pounds, um, the, the, uh, you know, there was a time when a, a pound note was exchangeable for a pound of maybe silver, I'm not sure, uh, where you could go into the, you know, the government central bank and you could say, here's my, here's my pound note, now hand me my, my pound of, of whatever it was, silver or something. But it rapidly became clear that, that wasn't a practical way to do things. Um, and so instead there was this moment when, when it changed, at least on British currency, and it said, you know, it said on the, on, the, on the pound notes, it said, you know, I promise to pay the bearer on demand the sum of one pound signed, you know, the treasurer of the country, whatever the heck that means, you know, I promise to pay the sum of one pound. Well, it's not really saying one pound of what. It's kind of a, a typical kind of a, a way of sort of defining something without defining something. But anyway, so then there's this sort of notion of, um, uh, of value that is something that is some, um, uh, Let's see, I'm, I'm about to back into kind of a whole uh, economics lesson here, but, but um, uh, there's, there's a sort of this question of what maintains the value of a, um, of a currency or, um, uh, gosh, this is kind of complicated. I, I think the, um, I mean, then there are issues like, for example, um, phenomena like inflation, like the idea that, you know, if I save up my dollars, my hundred dollars today might buy me a certain number of candy bars, but um, in ten years that hundred dollars will buy me less candy bars because there's been inflation. And the, and the most common phenomenon that seems to happen throughout uh, history, uh, with a few exceptions, is that there is inflation. That is, that the the price of things, the the list price of things, the number of dollars written on sort of this is how much the candy bar costs gradually increases. Sometimes hard to track that because you say, how much have prices increased over time? Well, we're not buying the same things that we bought 100 years ago. So you have to kind of have this basket, this bucket of things that constitute sort of a standard set of things one buys. And you have to sort of translate that over time. Time, this is a thing called the Consumer Price Index, CPI, which is an attempt to sort of track that kind of information. But um, so there's this phenomenon of inflation, which is a, a, a phenomenon that seems to happen in currencies. And uh, you know exactly why it happens is still somewhat subject to debate. I mean, you know, a lot of explanations that I hear wind up with, well, prices go up. Uh, well, yes, that's what inflation is. Why does it happen? Um, and to what extent can it can be controlled? And let's not get into the whole details of, of how banks lend money and how central banks relate to that and how interest rates work and so on. I'd be happy to, to explain what I at least know about those things at some point. But um, okay. So, but, but fundamentally, the, the maintenance of, of value for money is, is because people think it's valuable and they think that, uh, you know, X number of dollars is going to be something that they can exchange for goods that they want. Okay. Now, in, in part, the reason they think that is because there's sort of a stabilizing element, which is a government issuing that money. The government is saying they're going to put controls on that money. They're not going to like let people print dollars, you know, at random. They're not just going to let somebody in their in their garage print dollars and uh, flood the market with more dollars, and so the value of a particular dollar goes down, and so on. Um, the uh, um, the uh, I think um, um, it's uh, um, um, okay. So so you know so that's kind of the. Um, um, uh, you know, currencies as they exist, the fiat currencies are all sort of associated with governments that sort of guarantee value with the central banks of those governments that adjust interest rates to maintain things uh, with the fact that ultimately, you know, the country is backed by the force of sort of uh, people who say, oh, your money is worth nothing. 
um, they can go and you know uh, roll out the tanks and complain, so to speak. Okay, so that's how sort of at least very skating along the surface of how sort of ordinary sort of fiat currencies work. Go see it. something like Bitcoin. Why is Bitcoin worth anything? Who guarantees the value of Bitcoin? Well, it's not clear. The um, and, and there are in fact wild fluctuations. I mean, talk about inflation that's not really been seen in the digital currencies. Um, what's instead happened is these wild, uh, you know, going up, going down, um, uh, sort of uh, uh, pricing of these kinds of things are uh, much more like prices of stocks than of, of typical currencies. Um, now, you know, is there a way to stabilize a digital currency? That's a very interesting question. What do you need to be able to do that? Do you need a central bank that's deciding, oh, let's make more Bitcoin, let's make less Bitcoin and so on. The way Bitcoin worked, it's actually kind of a bizarre thing because it actually was based on an idea, I think, of mine. I mean, we don't know uh, who the inventor of Bitcoin was, um, but uh, uh, I rather think that a key idea of Bitcoin actually came from some science work that I did in the 1980s on this phenomenon of computational irreducibility. So uh, what, how does Bitcoin sort of uh, create value? How does it decide, you know, when, when somebody mines gold from the ground, somebody gets that gold, somebody and, so, and other people don't. How do you decide who gets, you know, who gets the gold? You have to go to effort to get the gold. Well, in Bitcoin, you do this thing called mining or so-called proof of work. Well, what you're doing is to essentially solve math problems which are computationally irreducible. So they're, they're solving this problem. It's a sort of cryptographic math problem. Um, and uh, the problem is arranged to be of a certain difficulty. And it's like, you have to uh, kind of, um, you have to solve this problem in order to mine a Bitcoin, in order to basically be the original person who mines the gold out of the ground to start the chain of sort of creating value, so to speak. And, and it's sort of bizarre for me because, you know, this idea of computational irreducibility, which started as a very abstract idea, uh, pretty soon you're discovering that these giant banks of uh, computers that are mining Bitcoin and are, are using huge amounts of electricity to do so because they're grinding through this phenomenon of computational irreducibility as a way of generating value. I actually don't think it's the right way to do it. Um, I think it was sort of a patch for how to do it at that time in, in the history of sort of ideas about computation, but still that's the way it's done. But okay, so then, then there's this, uh, uh, you have a Bitcoin and why is it worth how, what it's worth? Well, it's not really backed by any kind of economic activity. See, the thing is when you deal with dollars or something like that, there's trillions of dollars of actual economic activity of people actually buying and selling pigs and barley and, and chocolate and all kinds of other things and, and software and so on. And there's a lot of economic activity and that economic activity is happening in dollars. It makes a big difference in the world. Like for example, I think at some time in history, it was decided that oil prices will be quoted in dollars. It's a big deal that they're quoted in dollars and not in some other currency. Because that means that dollars become the medium of exchange for, for example, oil. Um, and uh, so there's, a, and there's real economic activity uh, around dollars. So in the case of Bitcoin, it could be the case that there was real economic activity around people buying and selling cups of coffee with Bitcoin, but there isn't. Um, and so instead what happened is that most of these digital currencies, most of the money that's going into and out of them is speculation. It's people saying, I'm gonna put money into Bitcoin on the, on the hope that the value of Bitcoin relative, relative to dollars, for example, is gonna go up and I'm gonna make money from it. And then somebody else will sort of take the other side of that and say, no, I think it's gonna go down, so I'm gonna sell my Bitcoin and so on. Um, and uh, so it's that kind of process of, of making a, a speculative market that has been the primary activity that's happened around cryptocurrencies to this point. And I don't think it's ultimately a very supportable thing because I think that, that um, uh, if there was real economic activity around cryptocurrencies, you have something just like dollars and so on, where, where you have um, uh, some sort of stability that comes from a sort of underlying iceberg of activity. Um, where instead of just pure speculation. Now, I personally think that computational contracts, the ability of computers to sort of make agreements with each other and for us to represent what we would otherwise write in legalese and computational language and have those things be, be things that are executed between computers, I think that will ultimately be the thing that makes cryptocurrency make sense. 
because that will be something where there's real economic activity that's happening purely in the computational domain and where it makes sense to have some medium of value that is itself purely computational. Now, you know, people also say, so occasionally various countries whose own currencies have been in, in trouble have considered adopting cryptocurrencies, purely digital currencies, as alternatives to their own currency. I think it happened in Argentina. I think people have talked about it for Venezuela, um, countries where there's been trouble with their own currency. Um, I, I think if that actually happened, um, it would, for any particular digital currency, um, for example, for an existing one like Bitcoin, it would dramatically change the dynamics and it would sort of become Argentinian Bitcoin, so to speak, or something like that. It would not stay the way it is right now. Uh, people hope, okay, I, I say one last thing about this, but people hope that, um, okay, interesting story. The, the, the question is, do you need humans and like central banks and other sort of human media for, for sort of maintaining economic stability? to exist, or is it enough to just have algorithms maintaining a cryptocurrency? Um, the, um, uh, a good example of this with the Ethereum cryptocurrency, there was a thing a few years ago called the DAO, the uh, Digital Autonomous Organization. Is that what it's called? I think that's the right, right term, terminology for it. Anyway, it was, a, it was essentially a, a, an investment vehicle, a venture capital thing that was going to be uh, done using Ethereum. And it, its big sort of slogan was, it has no human oversight. It's just determined by code. Everything that happens is determined by code. Okay, so a lot of money was put into this thing and somebody walked off with $50 million, but they did it by just running code. And the code that they ran was code that was completely valid code within the framework that had been built for this digital autonomous thing. And, um, uh, and so the question was, did they do anything wrong? Well, their, the intent of this, of putting the money into this thing was that it be used for lots of little projects. It wasn't the intent that somebody would just sort of walk off with the money. Um, but what they did was completely consistent with the system of quotes laws that had been created around this thing. It was just, everything was supposed to work with code and they were running a piece of code. And so uh, there was sort of an interesting question, what happened? I mean, what actually happened was, that people, there were sort of two camps of people. Some people said, well, it's code. We've got to go with the code and, um, uh, you know, and, and do what happens from that. And the other people said, let's make a fork of um, Ethereum and let's, let's fork it off and let's have a fork where we ignore that transaction. We kind of zero it out. We have humans come in and say, no, we can't operate just according to code and make um, uh, and, and, and sort of say that that's something we have to, as humans, we have to sort of throw out. Well, so sort of, the end result last I looked, I haven't looked at it for a while, that was a factor of 10 difference in value between the thing where, where it was, yes, let's allow the pure code to operate and let's, let's inject the human. So it was sort of an interesting test case of kind of AIs running the, uh, the financial system is can you just run it with code or do you eventually have to have sort of a human, human piece to this? Now, I might, I might say, because I, I would be remiss to not, not mention this, I, I, I um, uh, I've done a certain amount of work on blockchain and um, the sort of idea of cryptocurrencies. And actually, one of the issues with cryptocurrencies right now is that if you say, I want to do a Bitcoin transaction, it takes 10 minutes before that transaction clears, before you can really say, yes, I got the money, you got the money, and so on. Uh, many, and, and for example, the way that banks transfer money between each other, there's a thing called the SWIFT network, for example, which transfer ACH network, is that right? That transfers money between banks. And so if somebody, you know, if somebody writes you a check for $10 million, which would be nice, um, the, there's a question, how does that money actually get transferred? And there's a whole network that settles those, um, that, uh, um, that money and, and says, this bank paid that money to this person. And there's a whole sort of digital network that, that maintains how that works. Well, uh, and, and for smaller amounts of money, it, it works very fast. For things like Bitcoin, one of the issues has been it doesn't work very fast. And part of the reason it doesn't work fast is because it's maintaining a ledger where it's a public ledger of every transaction. And in a sense, you have to share, like for Bitcoin, it's maybe 5,000 uh, different separate places where there are copies of this ledger. Um, and each one of them has to sort of get and agree on a copy of the ledger um, in order for that transaction to be ratified and one to go on. But that's kind of silly because if there are two people who are doing a transaction and they're, you know, they're both in Palo Alto and there are uh, two other people and they're doing a transaction and they're in, uh, 
uh, the middle of Rwanda or something, the chances are that those two transactions will not interact with each other for a long, long time. You don't have to have agreed on both those transactions to be able to do the other one. So there's a question of, can you make a more distributed form of kind of ledger or consensus? And as it turns out, recently we figured out that um, using ideas from our project about fundamental physics, that there is a very good chance that there's a very cool way to make a much more decentralized, much more uh, um, uh, sort of localized form of ledger. Um, and uh, that will, will cause it to be the case that eventually the transaction of Palo Alto, Palo Alto and the transaction of Rwanda have to be settled together, but it doesn't have to happen for a long time. And you can have a consistent framework uh, where that doesn't happen. And it kind of re involves redefining a little bit yet another level of kind of abstraction for the idea of value and money and so on. But it's kind of an interesting thing. It, it, probably what will happen is sort of a form of money in which if you only care that your bank account is correct to 0.1% accuracy, you can know very quickly how much money you have. But if you really want it to be exactly correct with no possibility of error, it can take much longer to, to know that it's correct. And so that's a sort of an uncertainty principle for money that uh, is kind of a coming attraction. Um, all right, I unfortunately have to wrap up because I am supposed to, uh, this is my afternoon for, for um, uh, talking to people. I'm, I'm giving a, a technical presentation about physics to a group that is based in Chile. Um, although I suspect there'll be people from other places as well. And so I'll be talking about much more technical things here. Um, uh, but, uh, um, Gosh, well, this is fun for me. So I hope people are having fun. Um, lots of questions here that I didn't get to, I'm sorry. Uh, and um, we'll save them up for, um, uh, for another time. And um, I look forward to uh, interacting with you all um, in future. So thanks for coming. See you later. <laughs>